All right. Good morning, everybody, or should I say good afternoon? It's after 12 o'clock. Thank you for attending today's translational research seminar series uh, coordinated by Advanced CTR. Uh, today's talk is going to be given by Tracy Shea, who is the co-director of the Pilots Projects Program at Advanced CTR, as well as a professor of psychiatry and human behavior uh, at Brown University. Her talk today will be Treatment of Anger Problems in OEF, OIF Veterans, Results of a Randomized Controlled Trial. Um, we will be handling questions via the chat. So if you have any questions, please put them in, in the chat. We will do our best to uh, interrupt Tracy for any uh, pressing questions. Otherwise, uh, she will pause from time to time to see if anyone has some questions. Um, we would also ask that you uh, complete the uh, survey that will be pushed to attendees post uh, the event. With that, I will turn it over to Tracy. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the introduction. It's really, it's nice to be able to, um, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk about some of my work here with this group. Um, and I will say that, um, the title of my talk is is accurate, except not fully accurate, because when I was putting this together, I thought, well, this is the Center for Translational Research. So how do I put this in the context of um, translational research? So I took a step back and I'm going to talk about um, <clears throat> I'm going to spend some time talking about the translational context. Um, sorry. My phone keeps ringing. Stop it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the what's happened over the last, say, 20 years in terms of psychotherapy research at the VA, because that's the work that I do is um, psychotherapy research and um, with a focus on post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so um, I'm going to go over that context, and then I'm going to sort of move on to the work that I've done um, that is related to um, treatment of PTSD in veterans. So, <clears throat> so this is kind of a, I don't know, a little model perhaps of trying to outline some of the steps um, as I understand it for um, psychotherapy research at least um, that's translational. Of course, you have the basic research, treatment development, clinical trials, implementation and clinical settings, and then research outcomes, more research to improve outcomes, and then more clinical trials. So I'm not gonna really talk about the basic research of treatment development, um, but um, sorry, I'm gonna take my phone out of the, sorry. Um, my daughter's calling me and she's very persistent. She doesn't give up. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so I'm going to be talking more about the clinical trials, this part of it. Um, and to, to give a little background, mostly what I'm, there, there are a couple of prominent models of psychotherapy, more broadly speaking, in the field. Um, behavioral and cognitive. And they have years of, you know, more basic research. Um, I, you know, that have sort of identified some of the principles that are now um, present in therapies that have been developed based on those principles. Um, and these are the two types, these two models that I'm going to be talking about mostly um, because they've really predominated in terms of treatment of PTSD and some other disorders as well. Um, <clears throat> So taking a step back and thinking about um, clinical trials um, or thinking about psychotherapy for PTSD in, say, the early 2000s, um, uh, so I and actually, I started at the VA in 1990 um, and had a role as a um, you know, staff psychologist in the PTSD clinic. So I worked with veterans for many years, starting in 1990. So I remember this personally. Um, <clears throat> so, um, but speaking more broadly to start out in the field, more generally outside the, the VA, um, there 
there were a couple things that were clear. Clinical trials of treatments for PTSD um, had shown that psychotherapy was tended to be more effective than pharmacotherapy. So psychotherapy is sort of the treatment of choice for PTSD. Pharmacotherapy has a role, but it's not the predominant therapy. Um, and of those, these cognitive behavioral psychotherapies um, had the most evidence in the early 2000s. Um, and around that time, there was a real interest and push in the field um, that started to, um, for guidelines, treatment guidelines um, for disorders, including PTSD. Um, and they particularly emphasized, again, cognitive behavioral approaches because there was the most data for that. Um, so what about at the VA prior to <clears throat> you know, the early 2000s? Um, first of all, the huge majority of patients with PTSD were Vietnam veterans, um, had a lot of comorbidity and impaired, seriously impaired functioning often. Um, so it was a tough population. Um, in terms of what therapists were doing, less than 10% of therapists were use, using manualized psychotherapies, which has over time become more the norm in psychotherapy um, practice. Um, and also not very many clinicians were routinely talking about traumatic events um, in the psychotherapy. Uh, exposure therapy, which I will be talking more about, was rarely used. And, um, Mostly the work was present-oriented treatments like psychoeducation, supportive therapy. Um, and also um, surveys showed very, very minimal change or improvement. So there was very limited treatment responsiveness. So that's sort of the story at that point. Um, and around the early 2000s, the VA started um, an initiative to really transform mental health care. Um, in the VA. And that involved um, an interest in disseminating and implement, sorry, implementing evidence-based psychotherapies for mental health across all VAs. Sorry. Um, so the earliest focus was on PTSD um, because that was the most common mental health diagnosis in the VA. Um, so what they did was to look for existing evidence at the time. And again, the, the evidence suggested two forms of psychotherapy um, that were the most promising, prolonged exposure and cognitive processing therapy. Um, so this was already getting started, but then of course we had the, um, the beginning of the, the um, wars in Afghanistan and then Iraq. And so this kind of put much more I think urgency into having the best treatments because a lot of veterans were coming back with PTSD. So I think that added an urgency to getting these treatments implemented. Um, and these were the two treatments that um, were recommended um, to implement for PTSD in the VA. But I'm showing you this slide just to show that at the time, there was evidence for these treatments from clinical trials, but they were all based on primarily women and also um, uh, his, with a history of um, assault or rape. That was the population that had been studied. And there was very little evidence on veterans, if any, at that point in time. But given that it had the most data, the VA proceeded. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the implementation um, of these treatments in clinics across the VA. So just a little bit of a timeline. So you have this <clears throat> mental health strategic plan around 2005. Um, and then in um, 2006, this rollout, the term is used, um, began to train over 7,000 VA mental health providers um, in these empirically supported treatment. And in 2008, the handbook actually said all VA medical centers need to be able to provide, need to provide access to either prolonged exposure or cognitive processing therapy um, or CPT. Um, so that was a big mandate. I mean, it was pretty, um, you know, um, it, it, that's a whole nother topic about how that was received, but um, 
it, it really reflected, I think, again, the urgency to make sure these treatments, the, the most effective treatments were out there. Um, and by 2009, actually 96% of VA facilities were pr providing either um, PE or CPT or both. Um, so that's sort of, again, a context. And one of the points I wanna make here is that the VA is really a terrific system for this kind of work when you're talking about the implementation part of the spectrum. Um, at least as of 2014, there's 152 hospitals, there's over 800 um, community-based clinics, um, the, VA, the VA centers and so forth. Um, uh, so it's a, it's a wonderful system to actually do this kind of implementation work, which is not easy to do. Um, so moving on to this, incredible implementation effort, which did involve training, again, like nearly 7,000 clinicians using four days of didactic in-person training, followed by at least two supervised um, cases that were audio recorded, listened to by the supervisors. I mean, it was an enormous effort, um, actually, to train people. Um, so, that's all happened, that happened, and it's, it's expanded way beyond PTSD. It's also there for other disorders as well. Um, but then, you know, of course, there's been more research on how that's all working. Um, so to make a long story short, or try to simplify this, the, the results have been somewhat disappointing. Um, I think on average, you do see improvement with these treatments based on clinical trials um, from pre to post treatment, um, large effect sizes. But there are also a lot of limitations because a lot of veterans have been unwilling to engage in the treatment. Um, perhaps it's also some therapists have been reluctant to use them. Nobody really knows for sure. But we do know that a lot of veterans do not want to focus on trauma. Um, when they do, the dropout rates have been um, often quite high, and also there's limits to how effective um, these treatments have been. So um, I'm just giving you an overview here of sort of the what's known for um, the use of these two treatments in veterans through continuing uh, clinical trials, and there have been a large number of them, 15 um, randomized controlled trials, seven of CPT and eight of PE. So despite the improvement, you've got more up to 60% in these various studies that didn't show clinically significant improvement. So there, there may be some improvement, there may be no improvement, um, but um, it was the minority who really improved um, clinically in a, clinically significant fashion. So, um, and about two thirds still met PTSD criteria um, at the end of these treatments. Um, so um, the other thing is that neither of these treatments demonstrated clear superiority over non-trauma focused treatment, which was this, um, we, we developed, I actually, was, one of the developers of this present-centered therapy that was developed to be an active control for some of the big studies looking at trauma-focused treatments. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but it was an active control, meaning it was a therapy, but it um, was designed to control for um, sort of the, the common factors of psychotherapy that are present without the interventions being studied. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about that. But the, the other finding is that the dropout rates tended to be high and, and significantly higher than the present centered therapy condition um, where dropout rates were fairly low. So, um, you know, so one view is that these, based on this research, is that these first line psychotherapies that um, there's a real push to provide these. Um, I remember that as a clinician in a PTSD clinic. Um, uh, but the, you know, the, the results are very mixed and somewhat disappointing and certainly isn't enough for a lot of veterans. 
Um, how about research um, uptake in the VA clinics? Um, so moving on from the clinical trials, um, there's a few studies that have looked at this just excuse naturalistically. Me, excuse me, excuse yeah. Me, you, Ed Hart. yeah. Uh, I just okay. wanted to, uh, before you move on, maybe there, were, there was a question that came up uh, in the chat. Is there any follow-up data collected on specific reasons that the veterans drop up, drop out? That's a great question. Um, and I, I don't know that we have a clear sense. I can talk about it in my own studies that when you get, you start looking at the dropout, it's really hard to interpret. You get a lot of people who report logistical problems, like they just can't get there anymore, or they have childcare, or they're gonna move, or whatever. Um, some proportion report that they weren't getting better or that they didn't like the treatment, um, but that's the minority. So you could say, okay, well, it's, you know, they're, it, it's a population that has a hard time coming in every week. And, you know, there are these logistical issues, which are true, but why the difference between the two treatments? So it always makes me suspect that um, there's something else going on um, that they may say, well, I don't know if it's worth it to continue. I, I, I do have a change in my work schedule. You know what I mean? It's sort of trying to make um, a different and not really say, I don't want to come back. So it's, it's a good question. And I think we need to understand the dropout phenomenon a lot better. Um, so yeah, thank you for interrupting. I was going to pause and Thanks. I just kept going. Okay. So, um, okay. So the uptake was disappointing. Um, in 2014, this particular study showed that um, veterans who you know, attended a PTSD clinic and had at least one psychotherapy session, only 11% started one of these two treatments. And, you know, at this point, everybody had, every place had therapists trained in these treatments. So it's surprising. 8% um, completed. Um, and then even in 2021, it's a little better, but it's still not great. 27% started PE or CPT and only 14% had at least eight sessions. So it's still disappointing. And it does go back to that question, why? You know, why are not people starting the treatment and why are they, you know, um, so likely to drop out? Um, so, so that takes me to the next phase here of this journey, right? Which is, we, we're seeing a lot of research that really suggests we need better treatments. Um, so there's been a ton of research that has been done and it continues to be done to try to improve treatment outcomes for PTSD. And again, I'm just talking about PTSD here, not the other disorders that are present. Um, so um, some of this effort has been devoted to trying to make the trauma-focused treatments sort of more palatable or try to adapt them somewhat. And that has not really, um, I don't think, um, yielded a lot. Um, there's also been um, an effort to develop, test, modify alternative treatments besides these two trauma-focused treatments. So there's a huge amount. The only thing I'm going to talk about now is are the studies I've done, but there's a huge amount out there. So this is just a little piece of the um, of the of the picture, right? So um, here's an example study that. Um, I worked with colleagues to, we got a VA merit grant to do, it was a two-site study um, to look at an alternative treatment, um, see how it compared with the gold standard, which is prolonged exposure. Um, so um, it's for treatment of PTSD in veterans. So we did this equivalence trial, um, again, comparing, well, um, I mean, comparing interpersonal psychotherapy which was um, a form of psychotherapy that's been around for a long time. Um, it started out with treatment of depression and has um, now there's just this interest in applying it to PTSD because um, this therapy really focuses on the kind of interpersonal relationship problems that are so characteristic of veterans with PTSD, um, whether it's um, arguments, conflicts, whether it's withdrawal, 
whether it's difficulty communication, but the interpersonal consequences of PTSD um, are, are large. So it makes sense. It's a, it's a natural, you know, I think um, logical treatment. It does not focus on trauma. So it was, we thought it was a good alternative to see how it, it works out, um, to see how it does. So basically we're trying to show that it was as good as what was considered the gold standard. Um, so I'm not gonna go into great depth about this study. I'm gonna talk more about the other one, um, but this is what we ended up with. We randomized 115 veterans across two sites um, of which 109 actually started treatment. Um, and here's, the thing, I, again, what comes up is that we find for prolonged exposure, 49%, almost half, did not complete the therapy. Um, and um, for interpersonal therapy, it was 26%. So, you know, like almost twice as high in prolonged exposure. So we found the similar pattern, pattern in terms of um, dropouts. And what you can see here is, um, Basically, you know, looking at these, um, um, you know, change over time, that they were virtually identical in terms of change. In fact, interpersonal therapy ended up doing a little bit better, um, not much, not significantly so, but if anything, it was it was a little bit better. Um, so that's one. I know I'm just sort of giving a very quick overview, but it's really just to give you an example again of one study that among many that are trying to, to, to develop alternative treatments so that veterans with PTSD have more options. Um, so, um, okay, so here's the other one that I originally planned to spend the time talking about, um, which is treatment of anger problems. Um, and we called it the treat uh, treatment of um, trauma-related anger in um, OEF, OAF, and OND veterans. So we decided to focus on anger, um, and I'll say in a minute the, the multiple reasons why we decided to focus on that rather than PTSD per se. Um, so we got a merit grant to do this study. Um, and um, so you can say why well, focus on treatment of anger in veterans, and there's a lot of reasons. It's um, personally, my own and others clinical experience with Vietnam veterans, it really, it was striking how much having problems with anger um, affected their lives. And just, um, you know, divorce, um, losing jobs, um, ending up being very isolated um, was very, very common. And so when these veterans started coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, um, you know, myself and some colleagues said, you know, wouldn't it be great to try to see if we can get it, treat the anger earlier, maybe that's going to help in the long run. So that was the impetus back in 2006. Um, uh, another reason that it's important to study anger um, problems in veterans is um, the prevalence. It's really common, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, that, and I already mentioned the long-term effects of anger problems. Um, in multiple areas of functionings. And another thing that we've learned is that anger problems persist after, even after having trauma-focused treatments for those with PTSD. And I'll show you some data on that in a second. This is just a study in terms of the frequency of anger problems. Um, this was a sample of um, National Guard, mostly National Guard um, soldiers returning from Iraq. And we did just a naturalistic study assessing um, a whole bunch of stuff, but including PTSD symptoms. Um, and the arrow points to the PTSD symptom of anger. And as you can see, that is like 50% reported that they were having problems with anger. Um, that was true um, shortly after they came back and then also still at six months, um, there was still about half that were experiencing problems with anger. Um, the rest of these symptoms are sort of the hyperarousal symptoms um, of being, you know, very hypervigilant, having trouble sleeping, and so forth. Um, and then within the VA system, there's also reach th research that showed um, that anger um, was the most commonly 
reported problem that um, veterans who were at the VA were reporting since coming back. 57% um, reporting more problems controlling anger and some even 35% having thoughts or concerns about actually hurting someone. Um, so, um, and again, a, a, another study showed that when surveyed, military veterans and mental health services identified anger management more than any other problem as one of their top goals. So there's a lot of reason to do it. Um, I mentioned that there were um, residual symptoms um, after treatment with PE and CPT, and this just shows you that at following treatment with prolonged exposure, 80% still had problems with anger. And um, for CPT, it was very close, 78%. So more reason. Um, I talked about the impact on relationships. Um, it, it's... Um, you know, that, that the, the anger can really create a lot of fear in other people um, and ends up making the person feel very alienated in terms of social relationships. Um, sometimes people have thought, well, it's the PTSD that results in, in aggression and anger and problems, but there have been several studies that have shown that anger um, produces is associated with problems quite independent of PTSD. So it's not just PTSD. In fact, if you don't have anger, you're not going to have some of these problems to the extent that you do, even if you have PTSD. Um, any, um, I'll just finish this slide next and I'll see if anybody has any questions. Um, the other thing that's been reported is uh, an association of anger with suicidal ideation in OEF, OEF veterans. Um, and the other thing that's been shown is that having problems with anger predicts poorer response to PTSD treatments, um, in general. So, um, all right. Does anybody have any questions at this point? I can just, um, keep going. So you can say, why, why is anger such a common problem in combat veterans? Um, and there are lots of reasons why. Um, I'm just going to talk about one model, um, which is, um, I'm showing this model because this is the model that kind of underlies the treatment that we decided to study. Um, so it basically talks about um, that repeated combat exposure um, can, it sort of, you know, messes with your nervous system, right? Because you have to um, you have to turn on and off your, you know, your fight response. Um, and over time, it can result in these kind of deficits in areas that are very important to the management of anger. So you think of these like on a cognitive level, um, which involves, you know, thoughts and also perception, level of arousal, and then also behavior. So an exam, I mean, so for example, um, and, and I've seen that, it's, I mean, any clinician who's worked with these veterans can tell you that they're very hypersensitive to perception of threat. Um, and then what can happen is that threat can put them into what was termed um, survival mode, but it's basically a very hyper aroused state that then sort of knocks out other thought processes. Um, and then you take that threat perception high levels of arousal, and it just overcomes the normal inhibitory controls on aggression. So that's the model that we felt like made sense based for combat veterans. Um, and so we used this treatment that um, was developed by the folks who um, developed that model. Um, the other point I'll make is that we knew, um, we still don't have a lot of data on effectiveness of treatments for anger in veterans. Um, there's research on a lot of uncontrolled studies of groups therapy. Um, there have been uh, studies comparing like a group in person compared to telehealth. Um, but there's only two small scale um, randomized controlled trials for anger problems. One being the one I mentioned um, with the model that we and the treatment that we decided to use. Um, with Vietnam veterans back in 1997. And then the pilot study that we did for um, 
that preceded the study that I'm talking about right now. Um, um, so the aims Tracy, of the study- Tracy, can I interrupt for one moment? Sure, yeah. We just had one uh, additional question in the chat. Is there any relationship between anger and sleep in this population? Um, yeah, and that's that, yeah, they're correlated. And I, that is another, you know, contributing factor or reason why um, you see anger problems, we suspect, because if you're not sleeping, um, and sleep is a huge problem with PTSD, um, your, your threshold for anger is going to be that much lower. So yeah, they are related. How much sleep as compared to, uh, as compared to other factors, you know, um, are play a role is, you know, not clear, but I'm sure sleep plays a role. Um, and it would be very interesting. I mean, there are more studies now looking at um, like a co cognitive behavioral intervention for sleep problems. And it would be interesting to see if anger is reduced in those studies. I, I don't know that they've assessed that. It's something I really should look at because um, it, it's a in very interesting question. Okay, so we had these two aims um, to, you know, first of all, obviously um, compare this, look at this treatment that we're investigating. Um, and its effects on reducing anger and aggression in this population of returning veterans. We also looked at secondary measures of outcome like social, occupational functioning and quality of life. Um, so um, just briefly in terms of the methods, um, we again recruited um, returning veterans um, only because we felt like they're Again, their experiences were more recent um, and um, we wanted to you know, see if getting in there earlier could help. Um, uh, we also required that they be exposed to combat or traumatic events um, during their deployment in a war zone because that was more consistent with our model that we were looking at. They had to report problems with anger at a level of at least moderate severity um, or higher. And then we also required at least two more, two additional hyperarousal symptoms, like could be sleep problems or hypervigilance or something. So because that also fits with the model of the hyperarousal being really key um, to, or different aspects of the hyperarousal being key to um, some of the anger problems. So we randomized um, the participants um, to. 12 weekly sessions of, I'm gonna explain this in a bit more, the detail of the study, the treatment we're investigating in the active control. And then we've had assessments following sessions four and eight, um, post-treatment three and six months, um, follow-up after treatment. So, so the, I keep referring to this treatment, we called it the cognitive behavioral intervention rather than therapy because um, we felt like back at that time, there was such a stigma about mental health and getting treatment that we called an intervention rather than treatment, thinking it might be more palatable to people. I don't know if it actually was, but that's why we use that term. Um, so we adapted this treatment from the, what was called an anger control therapy that I've mentioned in the earlier study that um, you looked at this treatment with Vietnam veterans. So we adapted it to make it more um, comparable to, I mean, to make it more relevant for the current sample. Um, and then we compared that to um, what we called a supportive intervention, but which is basically present-centered therapy. Cause I, you know, I took present-centered therapy and we just adapted it um, to make it fit this population, this study. So it's basically the same um, supportive, um, present focused um, treatment. Uh, so a little bit about what is in this treatment. Um, there's we, emphasis on psychoeducation, which is very common, um, but we use this approach called battle mind training. W one thing I liked about this is that it, um, it sort of um, it was used by the military. They started to use it um, in, in um, you know, when people were coming back 
um, to provide some education and um, help people understand their symptoms. Basically presents, it says, you know, it's not just like you have these bad symptoms and not just like you have PTSD, not like you just have this mental health disorder, but you have these behaviors and feelings and problems that you needed to have when you were in the war zone, right? It kept you alive. You come back here and it just doesn't work anymore. So it was a very kind of more, I think, um, positive way to present um, why people were experiencing what they were rather than just saying you have a disorder. Um, and then we spent um, a focus, we had some focus on trying to bring the hyperarousal down, hypervigilance, um, using relaxus, relaxation exercises and imagery. And we gave them recordings to use at home and encouraged them to practice every day to try to bring it down. Um, and then like any cognitive behavioral therapy, um, uh, there's cognitive, what's referred to as cognitive restructuring. And that involves a very kind of systematic attempt to identify sort of these thoughts and beliefs that come up day to day and then try to challenge them and, um, you know, question them and try to, you know, sort of change perception um, and recognize when thoughts and beliefs are just not working and they're maladaptive and may not be accurate. Um, so that's a part of any cognitive therapy. Um, we had some behavioral strategies, just like, what do you do when you're too high on the scale and you can't think? Just take a time out, basically. Um, we also had training and um, ways of communicating when people were at lower thresholds um, of arousal to be able to not let it build up um, um, as tends to happen because they're so often afraid of their anger, they don't want to go there. Um, and then there was this component called inoculation training, um, which involves systematically kind of going through what the situations were that triggered each individual, you know, that person, um, and then establishing a hierarchy of these kinds of situations um, uh, ranked by how, how um, severely they provoked a response, you know. Um, and then in the session, we do um, imaginal exposure to these scenes. We try to get them to bring up the scene, get them to feel the anger in the session um, using this mental imagery and then shift in, this, you know, in their imagery to picturing themselves using some of the coping methods that they had been learning in the therapy. Um, so that was the cognitive um, CBI um, and then supportive, the supportive intervention I mentioned is um, present center therapy adapted, um, controlling for the nonspecific factors that are known to influence outcome, but don't have specific interventions that are being tested in the other treatment. So we had psychoeducation, same as in the other condition, a lot of um, basically supportive strategies, validation and problem solving. Um, so very focused on current issues. Okay, any questions at this point? Um, the, um, clinicians, and this is another, I think, um, advantage of the VA is that if you, for, in terms of implementation, so it involves training clinicians who we use clinicians who were primarily not all, but most were from our PTSD clinic. So other studies, there've been large studies that similarly lose their use therapists in the clinics. And the good thing about implementation is then those therapists are trained, they can continue to use it. Um, so it helps with that sort of movement from studies to the clinic. Um, so we train them in both conditions and then um, each therapist delivered both forms of psychotherapy, of, of treatment. Um, these were our data analyses. Um, I can go into this more if anybody has any question, but we basically used all the data, all the assessment points over time using um, HLM for repeated measures. Um, okay, so we randomized 92, um, almost equal across the tr treatment conditions. This is, looks, this is what our sample looked like. And um, a couple of things I'll highlight is that it's almost all male, which is, we tried to find women and it wasn't easy. Um, 
And we know that women veterans do have problems with anger, but we just weren't finding women who wanted to um, participate in the study. So it's mostly males um, and um, largely white, um, very reflective of the population, I, I would say, you know, at the um, Providence VA. We did have 20%, 21% who were Hispanic. Um, the other thing I would point out is that 65%, we didn't require a PTSD diagnosis because the data showed that there were a lot of veterans without the PTSD diagnosis who were struggling with anger problems. So we did not make that a requirement, but 65% of our participants did meet criteria for PTSD and about half had major depressive disorder. And then there was some alcohol use and drug use disorders, but they were not all that common. Um, so I'm just going to give you the, um, the findings uh, in one slide, basically, um, just to try to summarize it. These were our primary, I mean, our primary outcome measures. There were two, and then we had our secondary outcome measures. We did find that CBI was significantly better than the supportive intervention on um, what's called the STAXI-2. It's a self-report measure. Um, that's a standard measure used in assessing anger in studies. We also had an interview, um, which uh, assessed focus much more on specific incidents of aggression. We did not find a significant difference on the total score of that scale. Um, and then we found um, superiority of the cognitive intervention um, in terms of social functioning, and also in terms of um, interpersonal functioning, which is assessed by the outcome questionnaire and role functioning, and then quality of life. Um, so we did find you know, significant differences. And this just gives you a picture on the STAXI, the self-report me measure that I mentioned. Um, and the blue is CBI, the red is the supportive intervention. And you can see starting at session eight, there's a real separation there. Um, and they sort of lose a bit of that advantage over follow-up, but overall the whole course it was um, you know, significantly different. I can say that based on norms that are kind of getting a bit old, but the, um, the norms on this measure for males that are 30 years, 30 to 40 years, I think, which would be the closest to this population, are in the, is in the low 30s. So we still, they're not at the normative level, but they've decreased a lot, um, in, um, but still not normal. And this is just to, to give a picture of um, social functioning. This was a, a kind of a global measure. Um, so just showing at the end of treatment, um, the comparison of the CBI and SI, um, you can see again that, that only like 23 or 24% of the CBI actually had good functioning at the end of treatment. Um, none of them were classified as very good. So it's not great, but it's better. I don't have the pre and post here to show you, but there was improvement. And um, you can see that um, there were the participants in the CBI condition were doing better than the ones in the supportive intervention. So, let, you know, a lot fewer were rated as having poor functioning, um, and um, more of the CBI had fair or good functioning. Um, now, I've been holding this out because it's very disappointing to me, but the, despite the effects of CBI, we had a big dropout rate. So 50% did not complete the treatment. And this again, as I was saying before, I've, I've gone through these reasons, just combed through them to try to find like something that would be compelling, but it's just the, the same reasons as in the supportive interventions, just more. Um, so um, compared to the supportive intervention, only 18% dropped out. Um, so we've always speculated that, oh my gosh, I didn't realize how late it is. I'm going to just move on. Um, it's not just focusing on trauma that's associated with dropout. There's something else perhaps going on. So let me um, 
just try to summarize. Um, I think I've made all these points, but this was the first RCT of psychotherapy that compared to an active control for treatment of anger in veterans. First um, individual format anger treatment in this population. Um, and we did find uh, you know, that CBI is effective. Um, and also I didn't mention it was effective regardless of PTSD diagnosis, but there's the high dropout rates. And that's something you know, that we need to understand. I have thoughts about it. Maybe we can talk about that in the questions, but um, just to summary inclusions. And one of the things I wanted to do is highlight the advantages of the VA for translational um, research, especially as um, the, the dissemination and implementation part. Um, and um, just to mention also that um, there's a lot of research going on on other treatment approaches. Um, and I think, I think that treatments will continue to improve for veterans with PTSD as well as other disorders. I think that has improved despite the fact, the disappointing results of the, um, you know, the two um, first line treatments. I do think treatment is better at the VA now um, for PTSD. So I hope to see much more of that in the future. And I think, oh, I have to mention my collaborators, a lot of collaborators, of course, on the two studies. Um, I had a great group of um, collaborators in both studies, which made the studies possible. Um, and now I'm finished. Thank you for listening and um, let's see if there are any more questions. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. This is uh, Ed, Ed again uh, here. Um, there is a question um, in the chat. Uh, did those who dropped out differ at baseline in any meaningful way compared to those who continued treatment? And that, that was actually, uh, maybe I'll rephrase that in a, in a way I was thinking of, of that question independently was, can you predict who will drop out based on uh, any of the characteristics that you, you know, uh, uh, looking at the uh, cohorts that you've, uh, you've examined, you know, are there some uh, uh, biomarkers, if you will, some, some uh, behavioral markers that uh, could indicate a, uh, a, a likelihood of, of someone dropping out? Yeah, that's another good question. I have looked, I looked very carefully. I, there's much more to do to look at prediction. Um, but when, one of the things I was concerned about is because we had higher dropout um, was to make sure that there weren't baseline differences on severity of the anger measures. Um, and we also, and there wasn't, they're, they're basically were very comparable. I mean, just I, there, there was, was no difference in severity at baseline. And I also looked at um, sort of the, um, Last, we, the, um, we had assessments, as I mentioned, at four, eight, four and eight weeks, 12 post-treatment and follow-up. So I looked at like the last available assessment for the people who dropped out and compared that across the treatments. And if anything, CBI was doing a little bit better. So I was doing that because this is a little bit different than your question, I think, but I wanted to make sure that we weren't getting distorted results. And it wasn't just that those who were healthier were sticking it out and doing better in CBI and that that could explain the results. But looking at all that data showed that that was not the case. We didn't see any bias. Um, but the question of trying to predict in general who drops out um, and then more specifically, if there's differences among the treatments, um, that's something we haven't really looked carefully at yet. Um, but I think it's a good question. And uh, Sharon had a follow-up question. Does the change after treatment mean that these treatments should be of longer or even indefinite duration? Oh yeah, you know, that's another great question. Um, uh, I, and I, I'm not sure of the answer to that. Um, if they continued longer, would they have, would their scores have reduced more? Um, there's, there's research and literature on psychotherapy more generally, not this specific therapy, but there is this dose response curve that seems to suggest that after some point, you don't get that much more bang for your buck. People are gonna improve, they've kind of done it by this point. 
But on the other hand, I think it's the nature of our studies. It's really hard to do a study that is more than you know 12 weeks. Um, and um, so most of our studies are of treatments that are you know shorter term. Um, so would people benefit from longer term? I know that um, clinically, 12 weeks or 14 weeks of treatment for most veterans with PTSD who come into our clinic isn't enough. They need more treatment of whatever type. Sometimes they'll shift to another kind of treatment. Sometimes it's a longer term sort of um, um, focusing on you know, different aspects of functioning besides the trauma, what have you. So um, uh, this is a long way of saying I'm not sure, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Um, but it's, yeah, it's a good question. But they can see that the dropout would prevent studying longer treatment. I, 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 I am speculating that the dropout for, you know, what, which everybody kind of assumed was because people can't tolerate focusing on trauma, but this condition, our, our condition in this study did not focus on trauma. I mean, it's possible that focusing on the anger brought up, you know, memories of trauma, but I, I, it didn't focus on trauma. I think it has something to do with these treatments that are very structured, um, which is great because you can really focus and get some skills across. But on the other hand, sometimes they just want to come in and talk. And I think that's why this supportive intervention and the present center therapy do much better for in terms of retention. They don't do better in terms of effects, but people hang around because they like to talk and they get sick of the homework maybe in the other condition, I don't know. So it's very intriguing. What, what about a hybrid model? Yeah, yeah. Sort of balance it so that there's enough, not um, trying to fit everything into a session and a structured thing, but making sure. And I think, you know, um, that's probably what really good clinicians do try to do in practice. When you're doing a study, you know, there's adherence measures and we, you know, have to report on did, did they do everything they were supposed to do in sessions? So in studies, you really got to focus, but I'm, I'm, I think probably in practice, um, I know personally I did, you, you try to balance that. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Please uh, uh, send in the chat. It doesn't look like any, any others are coming in. So again, we're coming to the end of the hour. So thank you, Tracy, so much. This is very oh, informative, um, really uh, important problem. And thanks for all you do in the clinical setting with, with regard to this. Okay, so that uh, I think we'll, we'll wrap things up for this week's se seminar. And we uh, look, look forward to uh, Oh, uh, I guess I, sh I should remind folks to uh, complete the survey uh, instrument that will be uh, sent out to every all the attendees uh, af after this uh, session ends. Uh, we are eager to get your feedback on uh, the effectiveness of this program and any uh, suggestions that you have for improvements that we might, uh, might make. Uh, there is a comment that just came in. Thank you, Tracy, for a very interesting and informative session. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, take care.